everyone, and welcome to the Irish Writers Weekend in London, hosted by the British Library in association with Kirch International Festival of Literature. I'm Manuela Moza, the newly appointed director of Kirch, and we are absolutely delighted to be here for what will be a fantastic, thought-provoking, and celebratory weekend of events. Thank you to B. Rowlett and John Fawcett for doing such a great job in organizing all of this and bringing together all of these brilliant Irish writers. We're grateful for the support of Culture Island, the Embassy of Ireland in London, and our hotel partners, the Doyle Collection, without whose support this wouldn't be possible. And thank you so much to all of the staff and volunteers. We hope that you enjoy the talks and readings that will unfold over the course of these two days. And thank you so much for joining us. Now, please welcome to the stage Peggy Hughes, Wendy Erskine, and Jan Carson. Um, my name is Peggy Hughes, and a uh, great pleasure to be here today with Wendy Erskine and Jan Carson. Um, we're going to format, just to get that out of the way, we're going to have um, a chat about both of their remarkable books, The Raptures by Jan and Dance Move by Wendy. Um, and then I'm going to remind you right from the very top that this is your chance, really, to ask your questions as well. So do get thinking, and I'll remind you again before we, before we finish. Um, before I get into the bios for both Wendy and Jan, I just wanted to note for those that maybe didn't hear um, that Louise Kennedy, unfortunately, is no longer able to be at this event, as you would, um, you'll, you'll see um, from the stage. And we're really very sorry about that. And, um, uh, but she's fresh, obviously, from winning the novel of the year, so fair play. Um, Wendy Erskine lives in Belfast, and her debut collection, Sweet Home, was published by Sting and Fly in 2018. But this is the one we're on today, which is Dance Move. And I will say, just at this juncture, that the books are available um, over in the main library foyer, where we will all be running after the event, and hope that you will run behind us so you can get your copy and get it signed. Um, Wendy, um, as well, has been shortlisted and won several prizes, a long listed for the Gordon Byrne Prize, um, among others. Um, and her uh, second collection of stories was adapted for broadcast on Radio 4, which, well, some of you may have heard. Um, and she has just finished a fellowship with the Seamus Heaney Centre in Belfast, which also we may well talk a wee bit about. Um, before we get into it, I would just love it if you would join me again in giving them a really warm welcome to the theatre. Thank you. <laughs> So I think before we get into the actual books themselves, I think we'll have, we've got an hour together today, by the way, I should say. I think we'll have a little bit of a chat about um, just the context of being a writer from the North, mm -hmm. a Northern Irish writer, and what that means um, to both of you. First of all, Jan, I'll come to you, if I may. Um, do you think, you know, it is possible, this is a big question maybe, but is it possible to be a writer from Northern Ireland and not write about the North? Um, I think it is possible, and I, I do think that a lot of um, writers are now reserving the right to write about the same things that writers from around the world are writing about. They're concerned about gender and sexuality and financial issues and the environment and all of those big important issues we're all concerned about and not within a particular Northern Irish context. Um, for me, I was born in 1980, right in the middle of the Troubles. Um, and I feel like I kind of have stagnated in the troubles and the context of the North. And even when I try to write about other things, it just seems to sneak into my work all the time. So for me personally, I, I, don't, I think it'd be very difficult to write something that isn't um, related in some ways to the kind of socio-political context of Northern Ireland. But, you know, as writers, we are first and foremost storytellers. We have no kind of... Uh, prerequisite to change the world or engage with the big issues you fall in love with a character and you tell a story just so happens my characters are mostly living in Northern Ireland and they're also stagnating in the, the, the socio-political context of Northern Ireland so yeah for me personally I find it very hard to avoid out pegs. <laughs> what were you Wendy? Well, basically, I agree with Jan, absolutely. I mean, if you are a writer, your obligation is to nothing and nobody other than your creation, you know? And so if you want to write a novel about people obsessed with doorknobs or tortoises or something or other like that and have no reference whatsoever to socio-political situation there's there's no problem with that that's that's absolutely what you should do if that is what your artistic purpose is 
Um, for me, um, I want to write about, uh, mostly what I want to write about is people living in a sort of very particular social milieu. So I'm, I'm normally writing about people around the same number of streets. However, people are totally wrong, I think, if they think there's some sort of homogenous troubles experience. Um, or North experience, because people encounter it very differently. It depends on where you live, it depends on your political class, and it depends on your own specific history. Um, there's so many different variables that are going to result in um, different sorts of experiences being presented in fiction. So for me, it would run from somebody, say, whose life has been in a story like Lily and Dog from First Collection, very, very intimately connected to the um, troubles if, if that's what you want to call them. Um, whereas there might be another character and it has hardly touched them at all. I mean, there's, a, there's another character right about in that collection that's a sort of a pop star, monkey, Sid Barrett style person. It's irrelevant that he's from Belfast, absolutely irrelevant to him and his character. Class plays a dimension, but not necessarily being from, being from Belfast. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's a much, much, much more complex thing than just um, yeah, this is Northern Ireland or the north of Ireland. It's going to reflect this way in somebody's writing. It's all sorts of different experiences, different people. Wendy, do you, do you find, though, like, no matter what we write, we still get asked the political questions? Because I, I honestly think you could write a book about fluffy bunnies for children, and as soon as people hear you're from the north, they'll be like, can you explain the NI protocol, please? Yeah. yeah. I remember you, I remember us having a chat about this one time, Jan, and you said a really interesting thing, that you felt that... Um, writers from say for example england of maybe the same age would never be asked constitutional questions about the about um the uk that that writers from the north of ireland would would ever be asked it just comes with the territory literally yeah. um that that's what you're going to be that's what you're going to be asked about and in some ways it's not a bad thing we're adult people why should we not be asked about politics you know it's 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 not wrong but at the same time as you say it it puts a it puts a layer onto someone's writing or a, 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 a sort of a, it narrows the interpretation mm -hmm. sometimes to always look for that yeah and sometimes you just want to talk about writing and not you do not yeah about brexit or yeah. borders or yeah boris johnson <laughs> totally so the next book coming from jan carson is fluffy bunnies Nothing brexit, to do boris brexit and and borders um, I don't want something you've, you've just said there, Jan, though, about what sneaks in and what doesn't. You know, Kevin Barry said that of when he moved into a sort of old barracks and he said, oh, you know, I knew the old the Garda would kind of sneak into the work and so they did. What else sneaks in and how do you repel it or resist it? Do you? I mean, is there stuff that sort of tries to get in that you don't want? Um, I, I think this, the stuff that sneaks in is the really good stuff, to be honest. Like, I, I love in Wendy's work, I have the joy and the pleasure of living in the neighbourhood that Wendy writes about a lot. And it definitely, it sneaks into her work so much. And it colours now how, I, when I walk through East Belfast, how I look at things like tanning salons. And I'm looking through the window going, there's probably a story unfolding there because Wendy's highlighted the, the possibility of that. Uh, for me, the thing that, that's sneaking through a lot at the minute is language. Um, I, I grew up um, not really hearing Northern Irish accents on the TV or the radio, except if it was someone playing a paramilitary or a drunk. Um, and that's not the healthiest kind of context to grow up in as a child. And even later on, when Northern Irish accents did start to appear in films and, and TV programmes, they weren't Balamina ones like mine. Uh, Balamina is still waiting for its artistic revival. Let's just, that's a nice way to put it. So to be able to write in the vernacular of the place that you're from and to be able to, I went back to my local primary school um, about three months ago with this book to do some work with the P7 kids there. And they all wrote stories and then they said, one of the wee girls said, Jan, what's a better way of saying that? And she'd written a beautiful sentence in her Balamina tongue. I said, hold on now, that, there's no better way of saying that. Your words, your language, the way you use language is beautiful. And a lot of people have bought this book about kids like you in this school talking like you. So they think that your stories and your language is of worth as well. Um, and that's something that's it's really important. If you're, you know, if you're not from London, if you're not from um, you know, Edinburgh or places where people talk posh, um, it's really important that young people are able to hear themselves reflect it in work. So I guess that's what's sneaking into the margins of my work at the minute, language. 
Just on that note, though, is there anything, because I know you do quite a lot of your, you know, throwing it out there on Twitter, what would be a Northern Irish word for whatever, X, you know? Um, are there any words that just don't travel? And I think I'm thinking of Anna Burns, you know, when Milkman come out, people, the, uh, certainly the rhythms, you know, kind of, I think maybe yeah. travelled interestingly. Is there anything that... It was, it was super interesting. I sat, we had a, 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 attached to the University of Lorraine at the minute and they had a one-day academic symposium on my work last Friday. And I listened to my French translator and Spanish translator talk about the joys of trying to translate Northern Irishisms. So they're definitely... It's not what you'd think. It's words like Georgie Best was very hard to translate because... For us in the north, when you put in Georgie Best, yes, it means a footballer and a really great footballer, but it's also the connotations of, you know, George Best's lifestyle and what he came to represent, and that doesn't translate as well. So there are words like that. For me, um, the most problematic one was the word boke. Um, <laughs> boke is the Northern Irish I word. I just travelled, though. I think we've got a laugh there. We, I, I suspect really? we have some Northerners in the audience. <laughs> Boke is the word for, for vomiting. And I wanted to get the phrase or the spelling correct, so I put it on Twitter. How do you spell boke? Don't ever do that. I just got <laughs> 130 replies that were boke, 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 boke. B-O-A-K, B-O-K-E, and B-O-Q-U-E, which somebody commented, that's just boken with notions. <laughs> um, so you have to be very careful when you use Twitter for research. Absolutely. And Wendy, for you then, you know, what sneaks in? Same question. Sometimes it's just stuff that you don't realise that you're really obsessed with. And so well, sometimes what I've noticed in my stories is that people are constantly bleaching things. They're bleaching sinks. They're bleaching their... Now, I know I've got bleached hair, you know, but they're bleaching their hair. They're bleaching sinks. Um, and I normally have to cut out some of that bleaching because it becomes <laughs> so repetitive. And you think, what am I trying to do there? And I don't know if it's something about... And, and right, I gotta say as well, my house does not see a lot of bleach, um, so this is this is this is not something that's my own personal obsession, um, but it's something to do with in some way trying to, a, a sort of a symbolic I think thing in the story I think a sort of symbolic purification in in, in some way, but I suppose there's other things as well. Like one of my friends um, was saying to me about how um, there's lost children a lot of the time, missing children, and that crops up in a lot of the stories. Um, I suppose as well just the whole kind of unknowable um, nature of people. You know, one of the things I love is the whole idea of the home and the house and, you know, the various different, the fact that you can have a road with houses that are also similar looking, but inside there's all different rules. These are like little kingdoms and they've got the little statelets of the bedrooms and how they can be so different. So, but I suppose the closeness to people, but as well the sort of essential unknowability of people that, you, that you're very, very close to at the, at the, same, at the same time. So there's, there's that kind of thing. In terms of the language, you know, I can remember whenever I was a kid, um, sometimes, you know, I'd hear my mum and dad talking and they would be saying um, about they'd heard a rumour that so-and-so was doing a line with somebody else, right? And what they meant was an affair, you know? Um, but I don't know if that one would translate brilliantly um, necessarily out of the Northern Ireland context might suggest something a little more illegal, you know, than uh, what was actually happening. Absolutely. Uh, just before we move on to the books sort of more specifically, um, on that note, you've both lived away from Northern Ireland, and I just wonder what that perspective or distance brings into sharp focus about home. Did it change your voice or your, your perspective on your own work at all, Wendy, first? Well, I didn't start writing until 2016, so I'd never had anything written until, until then. So I lived in Glasgow for years and years and years, also lived in Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, and so I suppose... Um, I suppose when I come back to Northern Ireland, there were lots of things. So I came back in 1997, and there were lots of things that at first I found really kind of jarring or frightening or whatever, you know, murals, that sort of thing. And then within a couple of weeks, I almost didn't see them. They had, you know, a new normality had been, had been established. So I would have to say that in terms, of, in terms of the writing, I never really did any writing then at, at all. Um, I suppose in terms of writing, in terms of... You know, if you're thinking about yourself and the influences, um, you know, Glasgow would play a massive role and Scotland just generally sort of, I would always love to think of myself as like a Rebel Inc writer, um, you know, decades after Rebel Inc. But, you know, in terms of the actual writing, 
No. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I'm probably quite similar to Wendy. I started writing. I lived in the States in Portland and Oregon for four years, and it's where I started writing. But back then, I was writing very generic things that were set in a kind of unspecified place. Um, and it, it was only when I came back home to Northern Ireland that I began to very specifically hone in on writing about the North. Um, and I, I write on my feet. I, I walk a lot around East Belfast, around the city centre. Most of my writing's actually done up here, just looking at people. I, I write in a coffee shop in East Belfast every morning where I can look out at the bus stop on the Newton Arts Road and see the people there. So I, I've been in France for two months of a four month residency and I'm really struggling. I cannot look out the window and see any East Belfast people or listen to the kind of peculiarities of the accent. I'm an awful one for area wagon on conversations and buses and shops and, and the line at Tesco's. And obviously I can't do that in France. So um, I'm not writing very much, which is a bit worrying. So maybe both of us need to be quite immersed in the place that you're from. I guess I, I, I do a lot of community arts work as well. and. I would never steal someone's story from those experiences, but you are stealing little glimpses of um, people's experiences, like the nuances of how they respond. They all go into characters. And when you're not immersed in the community that you're writing about, I, I personally find it really difficult, although every writer writes differently. Some people like that distance. Mm. Is that the case for you, Wendy, or otherwise? Well, you know, I suppose I work in a school. I, I'm a full-time teacher, um, so I, I work in a secondary school, and that takes up a lot of my time. You know, I just try to write in the in the evenings whenever the whenever the job is done, basically. Um, and in in terms of what I'm trying to do, I want to live in the real world, um, and I don't want to, in some ways, just as you're saying, Jan. You know. Um, I want to have characters and stories that are kind of quite divorced from um, the people I actually encounter in, in, in the real world. And to me, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty important. I don't want to compromise other people whatsoever. Um, and so sometimes people will say to me, oh, this would make a great story for you. And I kind of think, no, <laughs> it, it wouldn't, you know, because I don't want to have to, I don't want to, have to use that. Um, so I suppose with, with me, it's the same in, in the sense that character is character is key, and getting to know these these characters that kind of it always sounds really mystic, Meg, sort of slightly Doris Stokes whenever I say this, but I'm wanting these people to kind of manifest themselves to me, um, and for me to kind of get to get to know them. So in a sense, yes, they're going to be based, you know, on you know occasional words or song lyrics or whatever that I might have encountered at some point in my life, but essentially I always feel they're somehow beyond beyond me and I'm, I'm trying to get to know them. Yeah. Does that sound weird? No, 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 it's right. It's just, there's something about kind of the, I don't know, the atmosphere of it. Like I, I was home for 24 hours there before I came here and I got on the glider, which is our fancy bus we have now in East Belfast. And it just, there's this moment where it's like, there you are, that's what people sound like. Just to be absolutely surrounded by mostly we lads slapping each other, but <laughs> hearing that kind of language and even, how people like con uh, like um, what my brain's tied up. What's what thing you do with work verbs? Conjugate, conjugate. not connotate. Conjugate. <laughs> How they conjugate the F word in Belfast is so creative. <laughs> and listening to them hear that, I've been missing in that. So sometimes it's it's not the specifics of things. It's more immersing yourself in the the mm. kind of general feeling of the place. Mm. Sonic mm. backdrop, as Aye. it were. I'm glad that Jen's bringing the F word and book to the British Library. It's all good. Very classic. Um, it's lovely. No, I wanted to come, come to you, Wendy, with the characters in, in Dance Move mm -hmm. specifically now. So, I mean, you just said the idea of kind of channeling them or, or bringing them out. I mean, could you just tell us a bit more? With stories, of course, there's several, even if it's the same world, there are several worlds, several state, little statelets or mm -hmm. little kingdoms, as mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about some of the, the creation of some of these ones? What, you know, mm -hmm. the weather in which this book was written, I mm -hmm. suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I mean, with, with a story collection like this, there's, there's 11 stories. And so in a sense, what you've got is probably about 24 minimum central characters. And even though I'm always writing about the same sort of general area, each world is totally different. And I always say about, you know, it's, it's exhausting to finish off writing what, and it sounds ridiculous to say somebody that's working as a scaffolder, for me to say, oh, it's so exhausting writing short stories. It seems absolutely preposterous, but 
to have to keep building up a new world is sometimes is sometimes quite quite a challenge. So I would start in this book with a story called Mathematics, and it's about um, a woman called Roberta, and her job is to um, to clean Airbnbs or to, to clean some sort of short term lets after there's been parties and after there's been all sorts of guests. And in one of these um, in one of these short term lets, she finds a child that has been left behind from one of the parties and she doesn't know what to do about this. She doesn't know. She doesn't want to go to the police because of certain circumstances. And what happens then is there's quite a transformational relationship then for both of these people. It's kind of an old story, sort of like a Silas Marner story of how a child coming into someone's life can be a, a transformational thing. So with a story like that, I don't I don't put pen to paper for about, a, about four weeks and I just think about it as I'm walking about, as I'm doing my business, I just think about it and I'm just trying to get to know these people. And then what I do is I always write a very, very long first draft. So maybe my, my, my usual length of story is about 6,000 words or so, but I would probably write 20,000 first draft, maybe three times what I need. And I'm just trying to get to know the characters and I don't often know what way it's gonna go. It's quite exciting because I just don't know what way things are going to happen. And I get to know the characters and I get to know the rhythms. And after I've written that 20,000, I read it quite clinically then and think, okay, what do we have here? You know, who's, who's of interest here? Who's, who's speaking to me? Um, so that's, that, would be, that would be one of the stories. I could, I could go on all day, I'm sure, but I'll only tell you about the one because don't want to bore you. Um, will that do? Is no, that not? Yeah. I mean, no, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I think we could we could listen to it all day. But I, I, when you're coming back through those twenty thousand mm -hmm. words, what are you seeking? Is it top notes or what? What do you know? What to, how do you know what to keep? I suppose. I think what I'm looking to keep is is what is is who is speaking to me most loudly, and it's so unpredictable. Sometimes there's somebody that I have thought is the absolute central concern of a story is actually really quite peripheral, and somebody else who's just there in the margins ends up being somebody that I think is is much more is much more interesting. And quite often as well, I don't know what a story is about until. Um, I've, I've read that first, that first draft, you know. So say, for example, the title story is called Dance Move. And it's about a, a woman who becomes really just quite, she becomes really quite annoyed about her daughter and the way her daughter is doing these inappropriate dances to, um, with, her, with her friend to, to music. And at first I thought, yeah, this is a story about um, fears to do with um, teen sexuality. You know, your fears for your child. In this in this whole arena and then i thought no, it's actually not that at all it's about this own woman's sense of stuckness the fact that there were certain things that happened in her own life which have meant that she hasn't really been able to move in a sort of literal and metaphorical way and i didn't really realize that whenever i was writing it until, until quite near the end so it's a lovely thing whenever your own writing sort of surprises you what's also lovely is it goes out to other people as soon as i finish the full stop and it's appearing somewhere it becomes your story as much as it is mine and if you tell me well what i see in it is something totally different well wonderful you know mm. jen we're going to hear it from a, not any of the stories you mentioned in a wee second i think wendy sure. memento mori which is sort of heartbreaking but can you tell us you're a story writer too is it similar yeah but the same or? with writing novels as well i mean I, f I feel like wendy and i are just going yes exactly <laughs> what wendy just said but <laughs> You know, it, it's it's fascinating and it's quite heartening to hear someone else articulate how you write as well. And um, there are, um, spoiler alert, there's 11 dead children in this book. Um, my um, publisher keeps saying, if you're going to tell people that you killed off 11 children during the pandemic, you need to also tell them it's quite a funny book. It is funny despite the children all dying, but there originally were 13 dead children. And my editor said, 13 is too many, 11 is fine, but get rid of two of them. And for me, that was quite painful because before I wrote the, the book, the novel took three months to write, but I spent six months writing short stories about each of those 13 children. Um, similar to what Wendy's talking, you know, Wendy's talking about a 20,000 word draft of a short story. I wrote 6,000, 4,000 word short stories about each character just to kind of find out, well, what, what matters to you and how do you see the world and what do you do when you get angry and what upsets you? And 
the process then of writing the novel, of putting them into a situation where they were under pressure and scary things were happening, it felt like, you know, I, I know how my mum reacts in situations because she's real to me. I knew how these kids would react because they sort of felt real and fully formed to me. So it was probably the easiest book I've ever writ um, written. It was a nightmare to edit, but it was really easy to write because of that. And that thing that Wendy's talking about, um, of just listening to your characters really mm -hmm. intently. Mm -hmm. Like I used to hear authors say, oh, my character told me to do that, or my character wanted to say that. That's never happened to me, but they have told me quite firmly what they wouldn't do or what they wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. Like you're trying to push me as a kind of mechanism for your narrative, and I wouldn't react like that, or I would never speak like that. Mm -hmm. And that only comes whenever you've spent significant amount of time Kind of getting to know them, walking around Belfast in the rain, having conversations in your head with them. Um, and for me, nicking wee bits of lots of different people, you know, I'll be like, oh, that character's got my um, my Auntie Audrey's sense of pernickadiness, and that character's got a bit of this man that I know, his kind of um, the rage that's under the surface. So they become these real people to you. I think from what you said, that's not your typical approach, though, Jan, to, write, to take each character and have a story. Is that, is that something you would do again, based on um, this, do you think? Or? I didn't do it again, because originally I'd thought of um, publishing the novel alongside the short story collection. So the short stories were all set the summer before the book was, so that readers could read the collection. And I'll be really honest, like some of them were shite. Like, <laughs> They would, nobody would have wanted to write them in a collection, so we didn't do that in the end. And I have a short story collection coming out next year, and three of the best ones from the Raptures are going into that. But I think there's so much of what we do as writers that you guys never get to see. You know, you don't get to see the messy bits and the frustration of, you know, I wrote all of these short stories and they didn't turn out like they were in my head. You know, I always think it's a bit cruel, you know, the, the visual artists, I went to the National Gallery yesterday and when people um, are now exhibiting the sketches that were made to go into this finished product, most people don't see that part for what we do, but it does happen, folks. There's a lot more of it than you'd think, um, a lot of kind of failed projects. Maybe you should bring your jotters along, manuscripts, so we could do a show and tell next time. All the <laughs> I know, I was talking to Donald Ryan stuff. They started an archive of his work in Boston. And, you know, we've talked about, like, well, how honest do you be? Like, do you show them, like, the really bad, messy drafts <laughs> in the notebooks or the almost their versions? Well, on, on that note, let's, I think, hear from both books. Maybe Jan will come to you first and then we'll come to you, Wendy. So if you tell us maybe just a wee bit um, of context as to what we're, what we're about to hear. Uh, so this novel is set in a fictional village called Ballylac outside Ballymena in County Antrim in 1993. Um, it's set mostly around a local rural primary school um, and an illness is sweeping through the children, killing them off one at a time. Um, it is cheerier than that sounds. Um, and we hear, see it mostly through the eyes of Hannah, who's 11 years old and she's the only child who hasn't come down with this illness and she wonders what's, what's going on. Um, I'm going to read you this little section where Ross has just died um, because it gives you an introduction to kind of this, the, the social context of what Ballylack is set against. And it's also really fun to read because there's some bits of language in it. Ross had only just turned 11. He was still a child, though the thought of girls was already pressing. He'd sometimes go through the case catalogue for pictures of women in bras and pants. He'd yet to touch a girl himself, had yet to taste coffee or travel anywhere in an airplane. He'd been looking forward to Lanzarote. It would have been his first time in a foreign place. Poor Ross, it's never easy going first. There's been no talk of the boys passing yet. It'll be mid-morning before the news spreads. In the houses and farms of Ballylack, people are getting on with their everyday doing. They're feeding the cows and drinking tea, watching the telly and heading to bed. There's no expectation that tomorrow will be much different from today. 93 has been an unremarkable year and the summer's shaping up to be equally forgettable. It's neither hot nor particularly damp. It isn't a World Cup year or one for the Olympics. Majors in Downing Street, Clintons in the White House, 
folks aren't sure what to make of him, keep an eye on that one. He's got notions, they like to say. There's talk of Clinton wading into the troubles. Word is, he thinks he can sort it out. Let the same fella have a run at it, better than him have tried and failed. Down south, Ireland win the Eurovision for the umpteenth year in a row. In your eyes is the song in question. You'd have a hard time dancing to it, though it's got a catchy hook. Makes a change from the usual earnest shite. Plunk, 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 and words about peace. What are the young ones listening to? Shaggy, Ace of Bass, Two Unlimited, Feel Good Euro hits. They don't sound half so feel good pumping through the tinny speakers of the GAA clubs and community centres where Ulster's youth hang out. Dancing, smoking, drinking cheap vodka to cant it into Fanta bottles. No, no limits will reach for the sky, the youngsters sing, fists pumping furiously to the beat, black bomber jackets soaking up their sweat. They go buck mad every time No Limits comes on. Sure, it's only a chin to them, not the call to arms it could be. No Limits indeed, what a load of bollocks. These kids hail from Ocher, Clocher and Cullybaggy. Say it out loud, Cullybaggy. You can practically hear the fences. They couldn't be more limited if they tried. <laughs> Elsewhere in the province, they're still at it, killing each other with bombs and guns. It's the 23rd or 4th summer of this nonsense. Depends on when you start to keep in count. Most folks are fed up with the whole thing. They're adamant the killing must stop. There's war in Bosnia and Afghanistan. There's a brutal one winding up in Rwanda. You can't turn on your telly for seeing dead bodies piled everywhere, blood pulling in the gutters, women howling and getting on. The people here are sick of death. This isn't a third world country. This is Britain, or this is Ireland, or both, or neither, or its own institution, peculiar as a maiden aunt. Either way, it's a civilized country. It's been a whole two years since McDonald's arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I've loads more questions springing out of that, but let's get Wendy to read two and then we can, we can enjoy a bit of story and then we'll get into it. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm just going to read the start of um, a, a story called Memento Mori. And this is a, this is a story about... Um, well, what, what, what made me write this was, you know, seeing those sort of like roadside memorials um, where somebody has died. And I'm, I started thinking, what would that be like if you had to see that every day? If that was outside your house, you know, and you were having to cope with your own situation, your own maybe complex personal situation. And you had this reminder of death always outside your house. So I wrote a story about um, two women, Gillian and Tracy, um, who end up having this outside their house. Um, but I'm just going to start from the very, um, from the very beginning. Gillian, I'll tell you, is now, um, she's now in jail. Memento Mori. The books in the library are fairly limited, mainly true crime and thrillers. Every so often, Gillian fills in a transfer request for titles of interest, and within three or four weeks, they come. Most frequently, she asks for books about gardens because, although there's a small plot here, opportunities are limited. In terms of other reading material, it usually takes a couple of days before she gets the Sunday paper, but she's used to that now. And anyway, she focuses so little on the actual news that it wouldn't matter. A paper, one week, two weeks old. On the last page of the magazine supplement, a woman, in response to a problem or supposed difficulty, gives circumlocutory and banal advice that spans a number of paragraphs. My advice to this person is basically to wise the fuck up In most circumstances, it would have been beneficial for the people to take heed. Yet there were times when someone who seemed a prime candidate for harsh pragmatism was treated with a degree of kindness because he or she reminded Tracy of somebody she used to know in London, in Liverpool, in other lives. And so when Gillian eventually does get the Sunday paper, 
on a Tuesday or Wednesday. She reads the problem page first and thinks of Tracy. Tracy used to say, Gillian, what in the name of God did you do before you met me? It surprised her that Gillian had been with so few people. Gillian always replied that she'd simply been waiting for her. She'd been waiting for Tracy. Thinking now that does seem the way of it. You know, sitting in a cafe in a foreign city, watching a young couple in the park, in the dark of the cinema, or when she had to put down a book because his evocation of some or other passion was so acute, she had all along been dreaming of Tracy, although she'd yet to meet her. Tracy, by contrast, had had plenty of previous partners, had even been married once. It's never going to work out, she said. Too young, too crazy. Lucky we got a year and a half out of it. Of all places, a book launch was where they met. Gillian's old friend, Wendy, had written some short stories. The launch took place at a bar down near the docks, which had not yet succumbed to anybody's notion of a new Belfast. Wendy and her husband had filled said bar with vases of lilies, but still the smell of stew lingered. Gillian was at a table with a rag bag of people, some who worked with her friend, a few neighbours, a taxi driver Wendy regularly used. Although they had all bought the book, duty fully, they agreed that they didn't read short stories or even like them all that much. Then another person joined them. She said that when Wendy next came in for a blow dry, she would just get her to tell the stories and that would save the bother of reading them. <laughs> Tracy was Wendy's hairdresser. There was dancing upstairs at the launch, prancing about in a pokey room above a pub was the last thing Gillian would enjoy, but that was where Tracy had been. The blonde hair framing her face was damp. She said she had to go because she was working early in the morning and did anyone fancy sharing a taxi? No one did. But Gillian said that she was leaving anyway and that if she wanted, she could give Tracy a lift to wherever she needed to go. Continues on. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy, I want to say I was at that book launch and I did not meet the love of my life, so I want my money well, back. Well, <laughs> I'm going to have to write a few more of these yeah, books and yeah. <laughs> more launches. That's yeah. it. I have a couple more wee questions. Then again, we'll, we'll come to you. There's going to be two roving mics, I think, and you'll get a chance to kind of ask your questions. But what really strikes me actually from both of those excellent readings um, is just that you, both, both in different ways, your abilities to kind of um, marry comedy and tragedy, as it were, or really the dark and the light in, in, in a single line, in a single story or chapter, and make neither the cheaper for it. Do you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm absolutely transfixed by that as a, as a, as a concept. I just wonder how, how you do it and why it's important, Wendy, first. Well, I think it's really important. But I, I absolutely think it is. And I ended up putting as the, um, at the start of the book that bit from William Blake about joy and woe being woven fine, um, that I'm what I'm trying to achieve. But it's never really a schematic thing that I'm thinking, right, there's been a downer for you know a few paragraphs here. Let's put in a couple of jokes. But to me, it's just so much to do with, with how I think life is, that you have got you know, distressing things so up close to things that, uh, that, that, are, that, are, that are funny, that things can just turn so quickly. And um, I suppose it's exactly what you're, what, you're, what you're saying that I was hoping to achieve, that it can embrace those things but not, but not cheapen it in any way. I often find books so unfunny as well. You know, I, I find life on the whole quite a laugh a lot of the time, and yet so many books are not all that funny. Um, and I think it's almost a deliberate decision to leave the humour out. Sometimes I think people maybe think it, it elevates it more, I don't know, to leave it out, but I don't think it does. In terms of that up-down, though, rhythm, do you, does that factor in when you're ordering the, the, the stories in a book like Dance Movie? You're thinking, oh, that's, or is that a naive way of thinking about it? I mean, is it, oh, that was a sadder story, you need a bit of levity or a bit of humour, or is, is that not a factor? I honestly don't think there's one of those stories really that's any sadder than any other. I, I'm, I'm hoping that all of them in a sense reflect that same sensibility of, 
you know, difficulty and joy in life because I suppose as well, right, I'm, I'm writing a lot of times about very difficult things. So there's, there's, you know, there's abuse, there's murder, there's coercion, there's imprisonment, there's all sorts of things here. And if that's all it is, it becomes just too much for people. Um, so there, there has to be a lightness and, and a joy in living at the, at, the, at the same time. And so hopefully all of the stories um, have those elements in them. I don't think there are any that are real downers or any that are like hilarious. I, I think that they all reflect that same sensibility, Peggy, I think. I would agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jen, what about you? Um, I, I thought about this a lot and I don't think, like, like Wendy, I would never be like, oh, I've just written two very sad sentences. Now I mm -hmm. need to make everyone laugh. But I, I think it's quite an Irish thing and I, I thought about this a wee while. I think our culture, it has this idea of hospitality at the centre of it. So a lot of Irish people are bent towards putting people at ease all the time. And you'll know this if you've ever got into a lift with an Irish person. We can't stand a silence. You have to talk about the weather. You have to make sure the other person's OK. You know, if you've been to anyone's house, you know that, you know, the food keeps coming out and the teapot keeps coming out. It's this constant desire to make sure the other person is at ease. And I think some of that has crept into how we do language and storytelling. Okay, I've just told you something really difficult. Are you okay? Are you all right? Do you know what might make you feel better if I get a wee laugh out of you? And I don't even know that we're doing it sometimes, but it's almost like undercutting the really difficult stuff with something that raises the mood and makes the other person feel at ease. So I'm basically saying I think Irish writers are quite generous to their readers often that you, whether you realise you're doing it or not, there's a, a subconscious kind of desire to, to guide a reader through, you know, a story like Wendy's talked about that are often about really difficult, desperately hard things, but you're kind of thinking about your reader throughout in a way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded by very much Wendy the writer being in Wendy's book. Um, not trying to insinuate that, oh, you, you yourselves have to be in your books, but I wonder, and I'll, Jan first actually, because I, I know that this book is very close to your upbringing and will have brought a lot of things into sharp focus. I just wonder how, you know, how, what made you decide to go there or how you retain the kind of personal boundary in, in dealing with that kind of material? So um, The Raptures is the book that I've always wanted to write and the one that I need it to write. It's about evangelical Protestantism, which is the kind of community, that born again kind of culture that I grew up in. Um, I grew up in a very conservative rural Presbyterian home um, all the way through the 80s, sort of under the kind of shadow of Ian Paisley. And I haven't seen much of much art, literature, um, film that, that deals with that world, but it's had a huge shape or a huge impact on things like how the politics of Northern Ireland have been formed. You know, to understand the DEP, I think you have to understand a little bit of that world. So I knew I was always going to write about it. I knew it was going to be a painful process. My family are still in that world. So there's, you know, there's a, a, always a hesitancy how to go to the honest places that you have to go to without hurting people. So I spent a long time trying to think about what was good about that community as well as what was negative, hypocritical, difficult. So I think there's a fair amount of balance and nuance in the book. Um, and I'll say this before I shut up, like I get asked a lot, how, you know, by people who are writing, how do you write about something that ha is grounded in reality that might hurt a lot of people, but you know you have to write about it? And the advice I always give is don't censor when you're writing. You know, write the first draft like no one else is ever going to read it except you. Because if you censor as you write, you'll get rid of all of the important stuff that needs to be in there. You can go back afterwards and think, I'm not going to put that in because that will hurt my grandmother. Or that's your choice as a writer to do that. What I found is when I had my first honest draft, there wasn't that much that I wanted to take out of it. I'd rather live with the implications than start to censor it. Um, but it, it wasn't an easy process. Anything you want to add, Wendy, in terms of Wendy the writer and what she's doing? Well, I'd just like to add that I think Jan's written an absolutely brilliant book. And I think as well that it is a community that are not often, they're not very visible. And also as well, a community that sometimes can be regarded as a bit of a, a joke almost, you know, which is very, very, very unfair. And, you know, to be able to see the good in a community like that, um, 
is a really is a really important thing, and I think it's a really unusual thing as well in terms of um, writing from from Ireland. So I think it's a, a wonderful book in, in that respect. Well, in all, in all sorts of respects, but you know that that respect um, particularly. Um, in terms of my story, I just did that for a wee joke, you know, because I put myself in that story and that, that was my launch and, and so on. And I thought, you know, one, one of the things I, I love in, in any writing is when very disparate characters come together, you know, um, people from absolutely different worlds. I return to that again and again because I, I love it when it happens to me in real life, you know, when you meet somebody that's totally from a different background and you get a glimpse into their life. and. You know, I thought, how I meet, how have these two women who are very different meet? And I thought, maybe my, maybe my book launch, you know, that'll, that'll do the trick there. Um, but in a sense, I'm all the people, you know, if it's, not, if it's not literally something that's happened to me, it's me projecting myself into how certain sorts of things would, would feel. So in a sense, you have to kind of, you know, listen to all of these, all of these people here. I, I find that... Um, Occasionally I write non-fiction and I find that a nightmare. I find that so difficult um, just because in a sense the truth always seems to be quite compromised. You know, I once wrote a thing about my son and uh, he's, well, he's about 15 or so and I, I said, right, I'll give you approval on this and uh, if there's anything you don't want in it, I'll take it out. And he was just like that, 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 that. All the bits that were gold he wanted out. But... That was important to me that I should do that I should do that because I didn't want to compromise him at all. But at the same time, um, in fiction, it's different because you can almost feel. It sounds it sounds very um, paradoxical, but you can kind of be because it's fiction. You can kind of get the truth more because you're only accountable to the characters. Who, mm. much as I find them really real, they don't actually exist. Mm -hmm. You know. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, we're, we're three Northern Irish women here and we could simply do this all day. So it's over to you. Um, we would love to hear your comments and questions. Are we getting the house lights up a wee bit so we can see any hands out there maybe? Do we have any, any cans there that we're missing? Give us a massive wave. I'm sure we've got one question, London. There's one there, a good person there. If we could get the mic down to here, that's lovely. Thank you. And I think we've got one at the back as well. It's right down at the front, third row, red, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're good. You're great. You're we good. can hear you. Um, I was reading somewhere that this is the first point in time where, like, the future seems quite bleak in literature. It's always dystopian when it's presented. And I just wondered, for a Northern Irish novel set in the future in, like, 2072, what kind of things do you think the characters would be preoccupied with? And how would they respond um, to sort of more global things that are happening, like climate change? Um, you, you don't have to wonder. <laughs> there are those novels, um, and it's, it's one of the things, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of folks who understand sci-fi a lot better than I do will tell you that in a conflict situation, one of the signs of recovery is when writers begin to write about the future. So, you know, if you are from a place that has a history of conflict, you in the midst of it, it's very hard to see beyond the image every day. And we've just had an explosion of, explosion is a difficult term in the context <laughs> of Northern Irish literature, but there's an awful lot more speculative science fiction fantasy writing coming out of the North. And as you said, like what, what they're doing is writing similarly to writers, sci-fi writers all around the world. They are looking at the climate change, they're looking at um, gender roles, they're looking at kind of power imbalance. Um, a lot of them that I've seen are creating kind of non-specific Northern Irish spaces, but there are a few people who are, are beginning to write with a kind of very Northern Irish flavour to what they're doing. Um, so yeah, watch this space. Um, there's a fantastic Northern Ireland um, like sci-fi group you can Google, and there's a really extensive list of all of the sci-fi and fantasy writers there. Mm -hmm. What's our year again? 2072? Is that it? Yeah. I imagine by 2072, you don't want to be, you know, terribly, terribly gloomy, but there'll be all sorts of problems that we haven't even conceptualised yet. I'm sure there'll be all sorts of um, terrible <laughs> directions that life is going to go in. Um, but I also think as well, people will still be interested in 
what we what we have now people will still be interested in being in love with the wrong person the person that they love not being interested in them um you know things that have happened to in the past all sorts of traumas i i think those will just continue as as they always will They'll in literature still be fighting about flags as well yeah it? probably from <laughs> hologram flags <laughs> i do hope not is there any other questions Mm, there's one right down on the front row. Thank you. We'll get to you if you just hang on so we can all hear. Lovely. Just right here. Thank you very much. There you go. One of the things that I find really interesting about Irish writing, and I am from the north of Ireland, is language and the context. And I think you mentioned something about things you would only hear at home. And there's other things that are more widespread. And when I came to London in 1974, and I spent a year trying to make myself understood because of the broad day. And then going, talking about people at home in the troubles, the Seamus Heaney, whatever you say, say nothing, was, you know, it was our household because my father worked for the MOD. Then on a different issue on language, looking at Facebook, I used to get barred from Facebook regularly for saying shit. But now I make comments on the current government and I call them shite.gov.uk. <laughs> but Facebook doesn't recognize shite as a swear <laughs> word, so it gets passed every time. So I'm really interested in the whole language thing. And I see later in the program tomorrow, there's the Ulysses Arena program. That was at another book festival, I think it was at Queen's Park a while back. So that again is language and people's different interpretation. And I think more so, and I think you mentioned it, it's the idiom and the vernacular where you say something that will mean something to people here, but at home, it me it's, there's a bit of black humor in there, you know? Yeah. So that's one of the things I find greatly interesting is the language. And Balavina, you know, great town, famous for Liam Neeson. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, I'll say something. I think until very recently, um, a lot of us who were using Northern Irish vernacular and stuff, there was a real emphasis from publishers coming along that you need to contextualise it, put footnotes, explain it. And that pissed me off no end because, you know, when Arundhati Roy writes about India, she drops in regional names and street names and food names and pieces of language. And as do lots of my favourite writers from around the world. So, you know, why did we have to do this? Um, and I think post Milkman, like Anna Burns did us such a favour because Milkman is unapologetically Northern Irish in its language, not just the word choice, but how she shapes sentence structures and how she tells a story. And I think that opened the doors for a lot of publishers to be like, yeah, th th they should be able to talk the way they actually talk. And readers aren't idiots. You know, you, readers understand and they sometimes actually like to learn new words and to hear different language as well. So I think Anna did us all a big service with Milkman. One of, the, one of the things that I get slightly nervous about sometimes is sort of, I suppose, sort of quite essentialist qualities to do with the country and the fact that because you're from the same landmass that you necessarily have, you know, are going to be riding in the same way as someone who is maybe 400 miles from where you mm -hmm. 300 miles from where from where you live so in a sense some of the aspects of language I don't see as essentially Irish I see them as essentially um, I suppose you would say um, I don't know if you really use the word region maybe just I don't know non non London maybe I don't know so I think maybe some of the issues that we'd say to do with language are also things that somebody like James Kelman um, would have encountered in, in Glasgow. In terms of the sort of sense of humour, I wonder is it so very difficult, different, you know, to somebody who's maybe writing in Liverpool or writing in Manchester. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things I, I kind of return to that I'm, 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 I'm just not entirely sure about, you know, people in the same country incredibly diverse people um, with very, very different themes, very, very different ages, all being bound together by some sort of essentialist notions of, of Irishness in some, in some way. Yeah, no, that's a fair, fair point, Wendy. Um, I'm aware we're coming to the close here. I've just got one, one final question for both of you. And it's just acknowledging that you have very varied 
portfolios and interests and lives. I mean, you're creatively flexing all over the place. I just wondered if you could tell us a wee bit about that and what that brings to how that's distilled into the work, if it's distilled into the work. Wendy first. Yes, well, basically, I have no strategy whatsoever with my career. Anything anybody's asked me to do that I found vaguely interesting, I've said, yes, I'll, I'll do it. And it's been brilliant. I've met just such a lot of great people. And one of the things that I've been doing recently is I've got a book out with PVA. They're called Paper Visual Art. They're based in Berlin and um, Dublin. And it's a book called Well, I Just Kind of Like It. And it's about art in the home. And the reason it's called Well, I Just Kind of Like It is because, you know, the idea of people you know, feeling a bit self-conscious about talking about art and they're just like, well, I just kind of like it. You know, they don't, they don't really want to um, offer some sort of, you know, art speak, you know, explanation of it. So it has got images from Richard Billingham and it's got images from um, Kathy Wilkes and wonderful, wonderful um, photographers and artists. And it's got all sorts of essays. It's, it's a bit like, an, it's, I wanted it to be like, you know, sort of annual you would have got, like Bunty or Jackie or whatever, you know, question. Uh, um, crossword on one page, a puzzle, and then a story. It's got all sorts of stuff in it. So that was a thrill to put together, and that's that's one of my things I've got out at the present. Also got a show in Rough Trade, um, for Rough Trade Books on Soho Radio. That's another wee thing that I do. So, Does yeah. that stuff feed the work, or is it separate? It's all part of a mix, or? Well, yeah, I suppose, like, I, I'm really interested in homes and houses. So, you know, I'm one of those people that if I go to the toilet upstairs in your house, I'll probably peer in the bedroom um, and <laughs> look in the other rooms just because I'm so nosy and interested in people's houses and how they are. But no, no judgment on messiness or in their own place is a disgrace. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's, yeah, that does, it does feed in. It's a, it's a total reflection of what I'm interested in as well in the fiction, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Um, I guess my other big passion in life, apart from writing, is community arts. So I've been involved in the kind of community arts sector um, since I was at university 24 years ago. Um, and increasingly, my work, um, I mean, a lot of, uh, many of you will know this, but a lot of um, the peace money that came to Northern Ireland went into the arts to create spaces where people could come together and get to know each other and create and, and respect, learn to respect each other's stories. And that was a joy to be part of that. But increasingly, my work began to focus on older people and then specifically with um, folks who are living with dementia. So for the last 10 years, I've done a lot of community arts practice with people who have dementia and their carers and the systems around that. Um, and it, it culminated in the last two years, I got to be part of a big research project at Queen's um, in Belfast, looking at how dementia is depicted in contemporary fiction, which I guess for, for um, Peggy's question about how does it inform your work, it was like both my worlds coming together. And we looked at um, 100 novels that have dementia as a narrative in them. We worked with people who have dementia, carers, um, social workers to work out, you know, how realistic the depictions were, what were the features of the language that was used. Um, it was a wonderful experience and off the back of that I was able to give the research findings and the experience to um, 14 Irish and British writers and commissioned 14 new stories that were dementia narratives. So we published in September from New Island a book called A Little Unsteadily Into Light, which is just the most beautiful title, I think. It's um, stage directions from Crap's Last Tape, um, A Little Unsteadily Into Light. But I think for me, it sums up the folks that I know who are living as well as they possibly can with a desperately difficult situation. You can't undermine either side. It, is a really difficult thing to live with dementia, but I also don't want to downplay the fact that some people I know are living bold, brilliant, wonderful lives with the condition. So we want to acknowledge both things. And we're very delighted because on Thursday, um, Nilla O'Connor's story, This Small Giddy Life, won the Irish Short Story of the Year. So it's um, the first one of the first stories in the collection. So if you would like to find out a little bit more about that project, um, there are essays explaining the research work and then 14 really fantastic short stories in the collection as well. Lovely. Well, there are two other books for your list, as well as these two wonderful books. I hope we've convinced you to come and come and check them out over at the, the main concourse. I honestly couldn't recommend them more highly. I'd like to thank you all in the room for coming. I'd like very much to thank and maybe wave at the people um, who are at home and online with us. Um, and I'd like to ask you to please join me in thanking very much Wendy Erskine and Jen Tyson. Thank you. Thank you.